this is a virtual lodge, so it's a new experience. Hopefully we won't run into any technical difficulties, um, but if we do, I hope you all will be understanding and um, uh, not hold it against us, okay? So uh, why did I write this book? Why did I write these, this series of books? Um, and the first and most obvious reason is to celebrate African-American women. Uh, we should be celebrated. We haven't always been celebrated. And I think this is an opportunity for us to be celebrated. I think that uh, African-American women tend to, we persevere, we overcome, we contribute, we excel, we succeed. But short of stereotypes, Sapphire, uh, the angry black woman. Um, I don't know if you guys recall, but uh, during the uh, Obama administration, uh, Michelle Obama was on the cover of a magazine with a big afro, nothing wrong with big afro, but she had an AK-47. Again, a way to uh, characterize us um, that is more stereotypical than anything else. Um, and the other thing is we're ignored, we aren't seen. Um, Breonna Taylor perhaps is a good example of uh, being ignored and unseen. Um, and then in the entertainment industry, we have lots of examples. The late, great Cicely Tyson, I, I saw a quote that she had. She said, we Black actresses have played so many prostitutes and drug addicts and housemaids, always negative. Mm -hmm. I won't play that kind of characterless role anymore, even if I have to go back to starving. And as we know, Cicely Tyson was true to her word. Um, mm -hmm. And so what is true for actresses in 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 Hollywood is also true for black women in the larger society. And so even though we have Michelle Obama, uh, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, uh, Oprah Winfrey, uh, Viola Davis, uh, Stacey Abrams, those are, um, they are getting a little bit more play play, but some of it is still negative. Um, in the vein of hidden figures and the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks, it's clear that if we don't tell our stories, we won't be seen and we won't mm -hmm. control the narrative. We may be seen, but we won't be seen in a way that I think uplifts us, uh, that celebrates us. And so that is really uh, the reason why I wanted to celebrate uh, African-American women. We do whatever we need to do. There's a PBS uh, American Masters documentary. All this stuff just happened to come up right before this all came up. So I wanted to share with y'all. Um, it, it involves Abby Lincoln, um, uh, um, uh, Cicely Tyson, um, um, and see, I'm, I'm blanking, but there are four or five African-American women who are, uh, uh, who are presented. And what she said is, she said, I believe the role of black women is the same role she's always played. You do what is necessary. That's what we've always done. And I think that it's a profound statement that mirrors what we're trying to do in these books. So I'm sharing with you black women who have done what is necessary. And so that's why um, I've chosen to do this. Uh, all all um, um, accolades really go to the ladies in the book. Um, we call these um, storytellers because most of the, uh, the way in which I wrote this is really use their, uh, their words. And so um, as a result, um, uh, they are telling their stories to us. So let me move on um, to um, introduce our storyteller for this afternoon. She is an entrepreneur. She's owned her own business for more than 20 years. And she has done what most of us want to do, but may only dream of, following her passion, which is the name of her story. So I'd like to welcome at this time, Ginger Campbell. And Hi, everyone. I'm going to put this on speaker view so that we can talk to Ginger. Uh, welcome, Ginger. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I guess my initial question to you is, why did you decide to share your story? Well, first of all, nobody ever asked me before. Um, and I guess the other reason is because I really kind of resonated with the title. I like the fact that it was ordinary, extraordinary, you know, because I think, well, I'm a Leo, you know, I want to be like the most fabulous person on the planet. I want my human <laughs> life and it hasn't quite happened yet. But 
I like the idea of ordinary people that, you know, may do things extraordinarily that that have an impact, even if it's not global, you know, it's in their community, it's in your school or, you know, the, the people who's who the people's lives who you touch. So tell us a little bit about your business. Since um, you are an entrepreneur, you're following your passion. This is what you've done taking a different path than many of your colleagues who went to the prestigious Kelly Kellogg uh, Business School. So tell us a little bit about your business. Yeah, I didn't make their money. But um, um, <laughs> although now, you know, I wish I was like, maybe I could have done it a little different. Um, but um, I am in, I basically have an integrated communications company. So essentially what that means is we do Event production, PR, branding, outreach, and marketing. You know, basically everything that you can do that would kind of promote or enhance someone, you know, a person, a product, or a business. And um, I kind of fell into it out of Kellogg, and I realized I had a really good engine for it. And so this is what I've been doing. And and I think I heard you say uh, that you're happy you made that choice. Yeah, I am very happy that I made the choice. I mean, like, there are times I wish I could have, like, been a brand manager because, like, I would have, I would have more stability and that sort of thing. You know, I, I would have had corporate experience, but, you know, I wouldn't trade it. I, I've had, it has been a journey, so I'm fine with it. And so that's what I mean about um, following her path. And so now what I'm going to do is, give you a bit of her story. I'm going to read an excerpt from her story. Once I finish reading the excerpt from the story, I'm going to uh, open the um, opportunity for the audience to ask Ginger questions. Um, so Ginger Campbell following her passion. Ginger Campbell's path was never intended to be traditional, and it has not been. In her words, I already had my Grammy acceptance speech and my Oscar acceptance speech written and rehearsed before I was 18. Raised with her sister Holly on a farm in the small village of Paw Paw, Michigan until she was 10 by Aunt B, by her Aunt B, who called her Ginger rather than her given name, Mary Lynn, Ginger Campbell was naturally attracted to her, her surroundings. I was, her words, I was very into anything kind of farmish. We had cows and horses and my dog had puppies twice a year. So I was basically Little Miss Farm Animal. Her time on her aunt's farm infused Ginger with a lifelong love of nature and, broad outdoor, and the broad outdoors. Her words, I loved it. Now I, like being, now I like being in nature. I like going hiking and stuff like that because I'm used to that outdoorsy kind of thing. Always, always there was, her words, always there was a part of me that wanted to work with celebrities. There were all these people I could see on TV and I'd say, I want to work with these people. I already know them. Ginger did not just want to know these people. She wanted to be one of them. She envisioned herself as both musician and actress destined for success and acclaim. And you all can't see this on the book, but there is a picture of her right here and she's dressed in feathers and everything. And it's really clear that she really did want to be an actress. It's the cutest thing. She's about, how old were you, Ginger? You know uh, how you uh, oh, In that picture, I think I was about, I don't know, seven, six or seven maybe. Okay. So um, she did not, Ginger um, always also wanted to be an actress, but her words, I sucked at it. <laughs> Ginger was not destined to be either a musician or actress. Never the, nevertheless, she has been enmeshed in the world of entertainment for the last 26 years, surrounded by the celebrity she, celebrities she dreamed of working with. Stevie Wonder, Whitney Houston, Eddie and Gerald LeVert, Monique, Dana Carvey, and many others. Um, so at a certain point, Ginger... Uh, we're going to move forward. She got an MBA, as I said, at the prestigious Kellogg School of Business. Her major was in international business, marketing, and organizational behavior. Yet by the time she graduated, she was still without a job. Above all else, Ginger was practical. 
Thus, needing to generate income, she did temporary work while testing a variety of possibilities, including an eight-day stint as a real estate agent. Finally, a friend directed her to the mayor's office of special events. This is in Chicago. The city special events office at that time was responsible for the Taste of Chicago Blues Fest, Gospel Fest, and Jazz Fest. These were big, very complicated festivals and events. The Taste of Chicago hosted 2.5 million people, while the Blues Fest accommodated 500,000 people. Ginger was enjoying her job, her words. I knew I liked it and it was fun. It allowed her to utilize her academic training, introduced her to issues and concepts with which she was familiar and opened doors that permitted her to work with new and sometimes exciting people. She was beginning to make a name for herself. In fact, Ginger was so successful in her first year that she, would, she got a promotion, but it was not without some drama, her words. At some point during all of this, there was this political drama playing out. Meanwhile, Harold Washington, the then first African-American mayor of Chicago had died and there was this impromptu funeral and just a lot of things going on. My supervisor made me acting general manager of, of Chicago. That meant everybody had to report to me and they were not happy about it. Subsequently, she left the job because uh, for, you can read why, uh, it wasn't a bad reason, it just simply the, 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 the transition, the uh, administration transitioned. And so then she was looking for a job. A friend from Kellogg called and said, Ginger, Jim Harris, a guy who graduated from Kellogg the year before had started an entertainment marketing company and is looking for people to do this tour. Her words, I was like, what's his number? It was a rock concert tour with Steve Winwood. They were looking for a tour sponsor, sponsor Michelob to be specific. At the time, Michelob's slogan was very popular. Some of you may remember, remember the night belongs to Michelob. Ginger successfully recruited Michelob to sponsor the tour and then proceeded to travel with the band on the rock and roll tour. She said she had a ball, her words. It was a 33 city tour. It started in St. Louis, home of Michelob, Anheuser-Busch and ended in Toronto. And I did that all summer, the summer of 88. It was the most fun a 28 year old could ever have. It was so much fun. My job was to do radio promotions. So I was working with the bands and sometimes we would take the band bus and go to various places. We had these nice neon lights and jackets and sweatshirts, part of the swag we would give to radio station winners. My other job was the pre and post hospitality part. Basically my job was to drink beer that summer and host parties and drink all night with the band. So that's what I did. We played Radio City Music Hall. We played out here in LA at the Universal Amphitheater I got to see a lot of places I had never been to before, before. The only problem was when the tour ended, Ginger was unemployed. Despite this anxiety inducing query, Ginger started looking for another job. Back in Chicago, I'm sorry, my sorry. Back in Chicago and, live, and back living in her mother's home, a friend who was working for a company marketing corporate events told Ginger that there were, they were in search of someone with experience marketing festivals. That was Ginger. She made the call and got the job. Her first assignment was to promote a festival featuring the Temptations with, without an advertising budget. The firm had received a large fee to promote the festivals and was under pressure to make sure there was a significant audience. Ginger called Chicago radio legend Herb Kent he agreed that he would promote the festival and she could get an interview with Otis Wilson, at the time one of the only two remaining original members of The Temptations, the other being Melvin Franklin. Of course, Ginger got, the her, got her the interview with both of them, her words. They were performing that night. I just went in and asked Otis to do the interview. This was after I opened the door and they were all in there getting dressed, a sight I could not unsee. At this point, professionally, Ginger was in a good space. She was doing the kinds of things she was coming to love and being very successful in the process. Sometimes our professional and personal lives mesh perfectly. Sometimes they do not. The latter was the case for Ginger as she was about to turn 30. I'll let you read the rest in terms of finding out what happened uh, when you buy the book. So that's um, an excerpt from the book. Um, Ginger, any reaction? 
Um, I was, Michael, my daughter is here. Well, first of all, she got all the musical and all the acting stuff that I sucked at. So that's a good thing. So it did get, even though I wanted it, she got it. So I feel better about that. But she was, I was laughing because she was like, all these stories she had never heard before. So I was telling her, no, it's true. It's true. I didn't do this. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, but it was, I mean, just kind of having had no real, like direction, it's kind of interesting how my life just kind of, I fell into events, I found out that I really liked it. And then like these opportunities, like, you know, how many people get to go on a rock and roll tour? Like nobody I know. I mean, so, I mean, it was fun and it all was kind of, it all prepared me in, in a way to kind of create my own business and, and to figure out the things I wanted to do and I didn't want to do. And I knew I loved working with celebrities and and so that kind of fueled my move to Los Angeles and, and working at Motown. And, you know, then I got to do like the Temptations dance with the Temptations in the lobby at, <laughs> at Motown. I just, you know, I mean, not that it was all fun, but, you know, but, but I have, I mean, given the fact that I was raised on this farm and then, you know, kind of then you're in Los Angeles and you're like, oh my God, you know, how, how did all that happen? All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to ask another Black History Month question. I don't know if that first answer got question got answered, and then we're going to turn it over to questions to the audience. You can either enter your questions in chat or raise your hand. I'm going to change it back to the uh, to the other view. So and I'm that... going to tell you, we do have a winner for the first question. The first person who an answered it cor correctly was J.C. Moore, and the answer was Shirley Chisholm. 1978, New York. She was the first black representative and she is the winner. So congratulations to you. Hi, JC, thank you very much. Just as an aside, uh, JC did an interview of me uh, a couple of weeks ago, the links to which are on our website. It was fun, JC um, is a, a, a Jim to the African-American community in terms of uh, interviewing us, interviewing us about issues that are relevant to us. And so I very much appreciate her. And as a result, don't mind giving you a book. <laughs> All right, so let's open the, uh, the questions to the audience. Um, and, and I would love it if you would ask questions of Ginger. Um, you can certainly ask questions of me, but this is about Ginger. Uh, and actually, I am going to put it back to, to uh, I don't know whether I should give it. it does, anyway. I don't think it matters because it's how people have it on their screen. So whether you change it or not, it doesn't matter. Okay. And hi, Mommy. Hi, Holly. <laughs> Everybody's on mute except for me. Oh, okay. Good. I have a question. I have a question. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, I have a question, Ginger. Um, since you um, since you changed in terms of your passion, well, your pat you are actually um, doing your passion. But since you realized that the entertainment field was not your thing, um, do you still get like spurts of, of moments where you say, "Wow, I sure wish I was on stage with them"? I mean, do you still get that? <laughs> well, no, because this is what I learned about doing events. That, that my job is to entertain the entertainers because the, the, the better I treat them, the more I pump them up and do the kind of thing, the better the performance is. So it, it's, it's actually me doing what I would have done on the stage, but doing it with the entertainer themselves. Okay. You know, okay. like, oh my God, you're so great. Oh my God, you want some more to eat? Okay, well, you like, oh my God, that dress is fly. I love it. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So you like the cheerleader? <laughs> yeah, I'm like the cheerleader. I'm the backstage okay. cheerleader. Right. So then when right. they go out, you know, you know, because I learned that. I mean, a lot of people, especially not maybe you know celebrities, but you know, when you produce an event, you know, they treat the the band and stuff. They don't treat them very nicely. And mm. you know, when you don't do that, I mean, you know, what's the old saying? You get more flies with with honey than vinegar, right? Exactly. So absolutely. when you're when you treat people badly, it it comes out in how in their performance. They don't want to do anything extra for you. They don't mm -hmm. want to, you know. They, I mean, just like you, you know, right. somebody was like, I try to do all that for them. Right. They're even nice to me. So I agree. I agree. That's kind of been my philosophy. So I I just try to 
to, to be the cheerleader and, you know, the best person I can be to them so that they put on a, a better show. And yes. then in the long run, that helps me get more work because it's a, it's a great event. People enjoy themselves. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. I have a question. Who was your Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You got to repeat because it got cut off. I said, I have a question for Miss Ginger. Who was your cheerleader? Oh my God. Um, I think my my aunt that I live with in, in Papa, my mom has been a big cheerleader. And my sister, my sister has always been my biggest cheerleader. She really has. How anything I do, Holly will say, You're the best ginger. You're the <laughs> and she's such a cancer. She just loves me. So it's so they have been, you know, and then then over time, you kind of pick up, you know, other people who, who either their clients or just, you know, people who have seen you and, and watched the evolution, I think. We'd love to see Holly, but she won't show her face. I don't mm -hmm. know. Either will mommy. I don't think. <laughs> they don't have their, their videos on. I have That's okay. They're there. Another question from April. Yes. Hi, Ginger. Hi, April. Um, my question um, is, when did you finally, I guess, reflect on your accomplishments and recognize that they were something amazing? I don't know that I still, honestly. I mean, because every day there's a new challenge. Every day you, you feel like you could have done something better. Like, you know, in production, which is what I do, you know, after I finish an event, I always do a kind of a recap, like, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, what could I have done better? So, you know, I, I think that in, um, that I never, I, I mean, like when you look at the, the, the tunnel vision of the, or not, I don't mean tunnel vision, I mean the long view, I guess, you know, in terms of where I started and where I am now. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a big step, but those steps it seemed like they were so tiny, you know, as, as they were happening, but I don't think I fully appreciated it. You know, getting older, I, you know, I do see, I try to like, you know, instruct my daughter, Michael, so she doesn't like get some of the pitfalls that I have experienced, but, you know, everybody has to learn and grow and, you know, sometimes you gotta, you know, like step in mud in order to know, avoid the mud next time. So it, I think it's still, it's still happening. Let me, let me interject and just say that that's part of the reason for these books, because my experience with the ladies that I interviewed in the first book and this book is they, none of them fully realize um, how wonderful they are. None of them fully realize how extraordinary they are. They see themselves as ordinary, um, despite the fact that they are very extraordinary in all the things that they do, whether that's with their families, with their communities, um, you know, whatever they do and in, in whatever way they interact, they react in many ways the way Ginger just did, su suggesting that, well, I, just, I don't really see it. And I want everybody else to see it. And that's why, that's part of the reason, April, why these books I think are important. Right. I think that's that's amazing. And it, it was funny when she was sitting there saying that her daughter was like, did that happen? I think that's so funny. Like when your child can like look look up to you and reflect back a situation that you've been through. So, and see like, oh, my mom's amazing. She's done some amazing stuff. Right. Absolutely. There's a question in the chat here. Um, I didn't know if anyone saw it. It said, how did your rural upbringing help you navigate navigate the big cityness of entertainment PR. And let me just, before before you answer, let me just say, now Ginger's not supposed to be looking in the chat, but you see that's that shows you how much control she has over what she does, which is a positive thing. Now go ahead. Well, just say <laughs> right. that. I don't have that in my chat because I'm watching it. Oh, because you know what? She sent it directly to me. That's why okay. it didn't go to everybody. Thank so you, you did your job. Thank you. You did your job. Um, <laughs> Um, so, um, I think, I think the rural upbringing, you know, it was such a big shift to go from living on a farm to living in Chicago, you know, it was just, it was just huge. Um, um, I think that the, the rural part of me 
and I, I, I don't even know if I want to say it's the rural part of me, maybe it's my Midwesternness, for, if there's such a word, um, is, you know, just to focus on people and, and, you know, Los Angeles is an interesting city to, to live in. You know, it's very smoke and mirrors. It's, it's um, you know, you don't oftentimes see the real people. You see kind of their facade. It's like you meet their representative um, almost. And, um, and so I just think that, that having kind of that Midwestern, you know, I don't know you till I've been to your house. Um, I, I want to know you and I'm not trying to necessarily use you for your connections or whatever, even though sometimes, you know, that is advantageous, um, not using, but, you know, trying to make those kind of associations. Um, I think that probably helped me more than anything, because when people kind of see that you're an authentic person and you're not, they're not necessarily meeting your representative, it, it makes things a little bit easier. I won't read any more chats. <laughs> Unless they come directly to you. <laughs> you can if you get them. And and anybody can raise your hand too. We're watching. So if you want to just raise your hand and as, as people have been doing, that'll be great too. Mm -hmm. Michael wants to ask a question and she's here. Okay. All right, Michael. Hey, everybody. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Okay, mom, I just want to know what you feel is next for you. Despite the pandemic, what is a dream that is um, that is left in the event production field that you would really like to live out? Why would she ask me the hardest question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great question. It was a good question. Um, couple of things. N number one, I think I want to... Um, I want to master, like, now that we've gotten into this whole virtual event thing, you know, I want to kind of master it more in terms of, I think people put together, uh, uh, turn that off. You, sorry, my cell phone is on. Um, I think that, that people do this, do events, but they're not very interesting. And there's got to be ways to, to invoke more excitement and more sensation into it so that you really feel like you're there as opposed to just everybody sitting behind their computer doing it. So that's, I think, one thing. Second thing I want to really do is I want to launch some uh, virtual classes on, on uh, event production and PR so that, you know, I can teach people how to do it because I'd like to eventually kind of move out of it and just kind of teach and speak. So that would be that I think are the things that I'm looking to, to do beyond that. Because I'd like to, you know, when everything opens up, I'd like to travel more and, you know, just kind of have more fun. I feel like right now I've been, you know, on the grindstone so many years that, you know, it'd be nice to be able to say, okay, I got a little money and I can do some other things. And so I see like, you know, having online platforms to do teaching and for various classes and stuff. I see that as a way to kind of extricate myself. Okay, we have another question and it's from Anita Diagler and it's what advice do you give for the college students pursuing a career in marketing? I'd say learn as much technology as you possibly can because so, I mean, the way things are advancing, you know, things are changing so rapidly. So while you may, you know, get the basics, the, the marketing and, you know, this is the, you know, the four P's and all that, that you learn in marketing that, you know, really kind of be open to catching whatever the next wave is. You know, we've got just, I mean, social media has blown everything up and it's kind of disrupted that whole kind of marketing thing because we've got more avenues. So how creative can you be? So when I say be better in technology, I mean, there's all these little things like I'm so not a a, a graphic artist, but there's Canva, right? And I can use Canva to make um, to make flyers and all the things that you know I normally couldn't do because there's templates already there. I just got to type on top of them, right? So just just you know just to be just to be open and to see you know kind of and knowledgeable in terms of what things are going to work best given the project that you're working on. Okay. 
I have another question from Nawasa Hooks, and it is, Ginger, did you ever think you would be featured in a book? And what did you think when you were first approached about being a part of this, this series? Oh, I thought, I was like, why is she asking me this? You know, I didn't, when, when Stephana called me and said, you know, Joy talked to me about you. And I was like, I'm not that interested. Are you sure? I'm just not that interested. I'm funny, but I'm not that interesting. And um, so my, at first I was like, I think, you know, I think she's not going to, she's going to talk to me and she's going to be like, nah, you know, her story really isn't all that interesting. But, but, but as I but did that it, was it, not the case. Let me interrupt and say, but that was clearly not the case. But I thought that, you know, especially since I've been a single mom, you know, I think that for a lot of people, you know, they don't, the, if that if they're ever in that situation like I was, you know, it's kind of like, what do you do? Like I had to make all these decisions around the fact that, you know, I, I have this child. And so I was, you know, I thought I was going to look at to, to get a job. And then I was like, but then I can't, all my family's in Chicago. I can't be, go to grandmother's day and Father's Day and Mother's Day and all that stuff if I had a real, you know, a full-time job. And so I decided to, to persist and stay in my business. So, you know, as Stephana talked to me, I, I realized, well, you know, maybe I do have a story to tell and maybe there's something that can be gleaned from my experience that might be an inspiration or, you know, a nugget of knowledge for somebody else who, who might be in that predicament or, or in that same situation. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I have a couple of questions, but I'm waiting for questions from the audience. Well, I think you should ask the next Black History Month question now, giving people a chance to. Okay, all right. Uh, the second Black History Month question is, who was the first Black woman to win the Nobel Prize in Literature? Answer in the chat room. First to the chat room. <laughs> First to the chat room. Uh oh, we got somebody. I got it. Oh, it's Olivia Pettit is the winner. <laughs> it's, I think I'm correct. Uh, oh, well, I hope I am. <laughs> but, uh, Stemna, who is the person? <laughs> Tony Morrison. <laughs> Yeah, she was the first one. It's Olivia Pettit, my daughter. <laughs> Yay! So Olivia and we didn't give the questions out in advance, no. so she had no uh, she had no uh, inside knowledge. I want no, to be not at all, that. not at all. But uh, very happy that she's on and and watching and and knows some stuff. <laughs> like um, one of the questions I have for you, Ginger, is uh, what was Two parts. One, what was the biggest obstacle? What has been your journey? The journey of all these ladies continues, obviously. But what what has been the biggest obstacle in your journey to follow your passion? And what do you consider to be your greatest accomplishment so far? OK, I think the biggest obstacle is that um, when you work for yourself, like when people say, oh, you know, I, I, like I didn't do this, it was just business, it's just business. You know, when it impacts your bottom line, it's very hard for you to say it's just business because you take it very personally. So I think that, um, you know, the stumbling blocks and things that I've, I've gone through with business have kind of been my greatest challenges, but they've also been my greatest rewards because, you know, it has taught me to be persistent. It has taught me to be, like, you know, okay, you can wallow in this little, you know, crying fit for a while. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, things have to be paid. you got to make money. So, you know, how do you put one foot in front of the other? Um, in terms of my greatest accomplishment, you know, I got to say it's my kid. <laughs> she, she really is my greatest accomplishment. Um, as I always say, she's my greatest production. Um but but it's it's interesting to see you know the, the things that you instill and the things that you talked about when they were smaller and kind of how they how they manifest themselves and 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 when you see what they grow to be you're like oh my god you know that's so amazing so I think that that's, that would be my answer. 
Somebody asked a question here. And I went to directly to you. It did. Okay. It said, you said you had a particular connection that gave you entree into launching your career. What would you say in general it was like for women starting a career in Chicago at that time? And how do you think it's changed, if, if at all, given Chicago politics? Well, I don't have a ton of experience in this, but, um, but I mean, yeah, I knew someone who was working at the city of Chicago and kind of that's how I got an entree. Otherwise, I don't even know that the city would have been an, an, an option for me. Um, with respect to politics, I mean, it's politics is very similar to the entertainment business. It's all nepotism and who you know. And 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 probably that's like that in any, you know, in anything, but, but particularly in kind of those fields where people really want to work. It, it's hard to work in. I mean, if I hadn't known the guy at Motown before, and and he did not mean to give me that job. I mean. My friend Danny, who was his assistant, called the wrong ginger. That's how I got to Because I'd been calling and he'd been ignoring my calls. And then Danny called me and then he got on the phone and started talking about some essence shoot. And I said, Essence, what are you talking about? And I said, He goes, Wait, is this ginger Campbell? And I was like, I was like yeah. So, I mean, so I think that it's, you know, it's it, it really, you know, who you know, I don't know if politics has changed, but I mean, those are just those, those kinds of fields that I think are just hard to break into unless you know somebody. So we got a question from Claudia Jordan and it says, why real estate for eight days? <laughs> <laughs> because like I was the only person I felt like out of Kellogg that didn't have a job. I left and I was like, I got to get a job. I got to get a job. And I'll never forget one of the lawyers that mommy worked with because it was like a commission based job. And then instead of all the jobs in the world, why did you have to get one that doesn't pay? <laughs> so, so I, the, the job was like, they wanted you to go to all these, like every office in the build in buildings, like you have a canvas building. And then you were supposed to like find out when their lease was up. And I was like, I can't do this. I mean, I don't even need a degree for this. Why? <laughs> so, so I, I, after eight days, I was just like, I can't do this no more. <laughs> and Peter Bynaw, he used to own the Denver Broncos or one of those teams. And I'll never forget, I came in and I had on these like combat pants and stuff. Cause I was like, I knew I was quitting. So I was walking in and walking out. And he was like, you must always dress in victory and defeat. I was like, okay, I'm sorry. I said, but I'm out. <laughs> do we have other questions? You can Don't do be the, shy. You can do the, uh, while they're thinking, you can do the next uh, question. Okay. The, Didn't we do the, three? Uh, uh just two so far. No, the, the this is the final uh, uh, question, and it, it it comes with some sadness. Um, what legendary actress from Sounder, Roots, and many other notable and trailblazing roles received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama and passed away on January twenty eighth, twenty twenty one? All right, all right, April, you were on it. April. <laughs> I didn't even finish, huh? Nope, you didn't get to finish. April is our winner for that book. And of course, that is that is the beautiful Cicely Tyson. Um, and she passed away two days ago. So other questions uh, of of uh, our storyteller Ginger. Oh, Beverly. Uh, Beverly, Beverly, unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. yeah, Ginger, um, a great story. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I keep going back in my mind thinking about just the, uh, the big difference from growing up on the farm to, you know, the entertainment business. I mean, what kind of metamorphosis did you go through? I mean, just, you know, spiritually, physically, emotionally, how did you align yourself uh, to uh, to make sure you didn't go into some of the pitfalls that 
we hear about that happens in the entertainment business? I, I guess because it started kind of in Chicago, because like when I was working at Taste, I mean, we did, you know, working with the city, I mean, we did a, a lot of festivals with a lot of the, the, the big artists. And then when I worked, uh, I left there and worked for Paulette Wolf. I mean, we did a lot of shows with, you know, I had to learn how to get name entertainment and how to do it. And, you know, some of the people just weren't that nice. You know, <laughs> they just weren't that pleasant to work with, you know? And um, and I just, I, I don't know that it was so much aligning. I think it, it, it was probably more when you, when I came to Los Angeles and, you know, suddenly, you know, you're going to the American Music Awards and, you know, all these things and you're meeting, you know, like the people that you always wanted to meet and you're seeing them. Um, I guess that kind of lifestyle, like I wanted them to know me, but I didn't necessarily, and I wanted to hang out kind of, but I didn't necessarily like, I like wine. My mother will attest to this soul, my sister. I love wine. And I think I drank, may have drank some beer back then too, but I was never like that interested in kind of anything else. You know, it's not like any, I was, I was afraid of drugs or, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I think that, that I just kind of kept myself in, in my little, you know, wine drinking can cocoon, for like, like a better term. And I just, and I, you know, the other thing is you gotta have money for excess, right? I mean, I wasn't like I was rolling either. So I think that's a better answer. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question. Um, okay. Or this is April again. <laughs> have you um, throughout your journey ever have like a, a full circle moment where you met someone that you always wanted to meet and was that experience just as amazing as you imagined it or did that um, encounter just change your outlook on that person? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Luther Vandross. Oh, oh she's going to name names. Going, oh, mom, don't tell her Luther's story. Oh, name names. <laughs> May he rest in peace. Go ahead. May he rest in peace. But I, I couldn't wait. I mean, I used to go to every Luther concert. I used to go to every everything. And after I worked with him, I said, I'm never given a dime to Luther Vandross. <laughs> It was again in my life. And even after he died, I was like, mommy got his album. I said, well, you can burn it and send it to me, but I'm not buying the song. I won't even give him 99 cents. Um, but, you know, then there were other people like, you know, like working with Patty LaBelle. And I mean, she was so nice. I was like, can I call you Aunt Patty? And she says, yeah, baby. So, you know, you get both sides and, and, and sometimes, I mean, sometimes you catch people just on a bad day, just like people meet you and then maybe you're not your best, you're hundred percent self, you know, with them. And then just sometimes people, um, oftentimes I think in, in, uh, especially celebrities, you know, they, they tend to believe their own press and that's always a bad situation <laughs> when you believe your own press. Thank you for that. Stephanie, we got a question about how do you get the book? Oh, okay. Um, well, our website is on the, um, on, in the chat room. And um, so uh, you can get the book from, and it's in hardback, paperback, and, and, and you can also get the ebook. And um, Copies of the book are available at our website, Jewel Dread and Publishing. They're also, obviously, the ebook is on Amazon. Uh, it will be uh, also available for the Nook. Um, um, and let me also say that to the extent that any of you have a particular bookstore, local bookstore, black bookstore that you want uh, to carry the book, send us information at, at uh, info at jeweljordan.com. Jewel Jordan, Jewel Jordan Publishing .com, and we will take that into account as well. Uh, we'll do whatever we can to uh, accommodate um, anybody who wants to get the book. Because as we see, and this is a good way to 
wind it up. As we, Ginger is delightful. And her story is, um, I think, one that resonates with a lot of people. I am um, always, I was moved by her story in part because she not only followed her passion, but she said she has no regrets. And so many of us sometimes do things we don't always want to do uh, because of this, that, or the other. And, and, you know, I make no negative comments about that, but I think it is a wonderful thing when you can have a passion and follow it, irrespective of the, the pitfalls and the challenges. And as you will read in Ginger's story, she had several roadblocks and obstacles. She always overcame them, and she also didn't let any of it get her down. There's some that are, you know, uh, and you think, wow, that's, but, you know, and I think that is true for all the ladies in the book. Um, um, it is just simply a matter of, um, you know, you see a particular situation, you address it and you go forward. All the ladies are successful. They are all as delightful as Ginger, perhaps not with the quick wit um, that she has, but they are very delightful. And um, I encourage you all to uh, get the book. We also should let you know that we have um, five more, I think I said this in the beginning, we have five more launches. Um, uh, the next will be with Dr. Brooks um, and um, Renee Gordon, uh, both of whom are from Philadelphia and that's gonna be on February 28th. I'm sorry, February 21st, bless my heart. February 21st, it's at, um, 2 p.m. Eastern time. The, the interesting thing about this little dynamic in terms of virtual is we have to make sure you understand the times, the time differences. So it's 2 p.m. Eastern time, uh, 1 p.m. Central time, 11, 10 p.m., I mean, 12 p.m. Mountain time and 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. And if there's any other time zones, I can't really help you. Uh, but uh, so please join us for that. Um, I want to thank you all. Let me see. Um, oh, I got to ask the, the, the final. No, I did that. Uh, I would ask uh, uh, Joy or Brian to help me if there's something I've left out. Acknowledgement. Oh. <clears throat> huh? What now? Um, you, you, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, let me let me let me say a couple of things. Also, as I indicated, uh, we had a wonderful interview with J.C. Moore, uh, and the links to that uh, her podcast and YouTube will be on our website and Facebook page. We also there's a new streaming network called Fox Soul, um, and um, we're going to be on the Sean's Fox Soul program on March first. That link will also be, I think it'll be live and that link will also be on the JJ, the Jewel Jordan Publishing website. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, the third book, uh, Ordinary Extraordinary African-American Women, um, The Millennials, that's women from 25 to 49, I'm sorry, 25 to uh, 45. Um, I'm having a brain problem right now. But in any event, um, we have already started that book, but to the extent that you have a recommendation of somebody you'd like to see in the book, certainly feel free to send us that recommendation, but we would ask that you let us know in your um, recommendation why you think that person should be included in the book. It's important to know that the ladies in the first book, the 10th June, Davis and the ladies in the first book, 10 ladies in the first book, Ginger and the 12 ladies in this book are representative of African-American women. Obviously, these aren't the only ordinary, extraordinary African-American women. They're representative. And so um, um, if you have somebody who you think would also provide that uh, representation, please feel free to contact us, info at jojordanpublishing.com. Uh, thank you to Joy, Brian, everybody who has been instrumental in getting this first launch going in, in the book, um, all of you all who are there. Um, thank you. Um, most of all, thank you to Ginger Campbell for sharing your story and for uh, uh, agreeing to, to share your journey uh, with all of us. Um, 
I don't have anything else unless somebody tells me something else to say. I just appreciate you all and, and really um, am, am, am just so happy that you joined us. Please join us again for our next launch. Take good care, stay safe, wear your masks. Blessings. Thank you all for coming. I love seeing all of your faces, all those who are in our lives, uh, Stephanie's life, my life, Winnell's life. We just are so thankful that you all came out. So we appreciate. It's good to see you all. Thank you. Blessings. <laughs>